So we, um, before I go further, I would like to invite our leader, uh, Dean of the uh, School of Arts and Social Sciences, Professor Charles Cohn, to come on stage and say a few opening words. Thank you, Charles. Can I use this one? Oh. The other word. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I'm I'm so glad to to say to see so many new and old friends here and see all the students here. Okay, uh dear DMH, Professor Cole, Dr. Emily Chen, Dr. Kevin Yip, Dr. Darren Jung, and Dr. Daphne Ma, guests school members and students. On behalf of the School of Arts and Social Sciences, Hong Kong Metropolitan University, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you. It's a timely seminar as smart city become a buzzword nowadays. Actually, I, I would like to say that our school just successfully beat a research project grant of 4 million from the Smart Traffic Fund but I would like to say most of the discussion about smart city focused on the technical aspect. However, the social science aspect or the social aspect, or in particular, the topic today, trust, is so important element to successfully build a smart city. The use of the app Leave Home Safe over the past year in Hong Kong, I think it is a very best illustration about trust in smart city. I'm pleased to have the support from the French Center for Research on Contemporary China, Consulate General of France in Hong Kong, Macau, and the academic friends from the Hong Kong Baptist U. So we can have this important seminar held in our university. Thank you so much for your support. I look forward to having more interaction and collaboration with all of you in future. Last but never least, thank you for your participation and hope all of you enjoyed this seminar. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we may proceed with the gift uh, souvenir presentation from uh, Hong Kong Metropolitan University to each of our guests, and the gift will be given by our dean. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Yes. So now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Pierre Miège to uh, to come uh, here to explain to you, uh, to uh, students and our colleagues, what the French Center for Research on Contemporary China is all about, and most importantly, what China perspective is. You are students in um, basically the course on uh, contemporary Chinese politics, and you should know that China perspective has plenty of articles that are very useful for your respective assignments. So let's uh, hear more from Pierre. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everybody, to the students, and thank you to our colleagues for being here today. And of course, I would like to thank the Metropolitan University for inviting us and giving the opportunity to present you the center. And there's other member of the centers sitting over there if you have questions. Um, so the, the, the CFC, the, the, the French Research Center, is, was created in 1992. So it's already a relatively old center in Hong Kong. It's a center in social sciences that hosts uh, French and European scholars who come to the center to study for a few years about Chinese, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, uh, different topics on these uh, territories in social sciences. Uh, so we have anthropologists, economists, politicists, and of course we have students um, that we had before COVID. So, and the center has a branch in uh, Taipei. Um, and of course, as Emily uh, mentioned, one thing very important is that the center publishes China Perspectives, which is a bilingual journal um, in social sciences about China. And it's a journal which is already more than 30 years old. So there's plenty of 
articles that have been uh, published. And one thing that makes this journal a little bit different from other journals is that there's always a special feature. So a group of articles on a topic that we work on with guest editors. So, oops. Uh, so one of the issues that we had was on smart cities. So it's it's a it's a special features that we prepared that was proposed to us and that we worked together with Amy, Professor Emily Pan and Professor Alistair Cole. Uh, so um, and this special feature, so the different articles. So you will see some of the the, the researchers who participated in writing these articles. So this, this was based on their own research uh, conducted at Baptist University that they will present uh, for you. So what is very interesting in the fact that we're having a special features is, is not only that you have more than one article on a topic, it's also that the guest editors write an, an editorial that I really advise you to read the students because it really brings the different articles in a larger perspective of existing research and the, the existing knowledge. So it's, it's something very interesting. It's, it's a shorter article, but it's usually something that is extremely important to really understand everything that is at stake behind the topic. So um, thank you again to the Metropolitan University. Thank you for all the colleagues who can to present you with their work. Uh, thank you, Professor, and, and for the gifts and, and the invitation. And again, uh, please uh, check online uh, the cfc.com.hk. We have a website and you can find very easily China Perspectives. And you will find a lot of articles that might interest you in every topics from economics to modern arts and literature. You will find lots of things that will be interesting for you. So. I, I let uh, Emily or maybe directly the speakers if you want to yeah. to start the conversation. Thank you. So now we are going to proceed with the uh, uh, presentation of the special issue with our um, uh, respective articles. And uh, the first one, so uh, Professor Alistair Cole is the head of the uh, Department of Government and International Studies at the Hong Kong Baptist University. And uh, we collaborated together in order to uh, do this uh, research project. Indeed, uh, some um, the, in the last two years, and we are happy to share with you this um, special issue. So I'm just trying to minimize my window here. Okay, and then close this, sorry. So, let's start. So here, we will have three presentations now. So the first presentation will be uh, by uh, Alistair and myself, and then we proceed with the article by uh, uh, Dr. Darren Chung and Dr. Daphne Ma, and then the third article will be by a uh, former colleague also from uh, HKBU, Dr. Kevin Ip. So for um, Alistair and my part, we will be doing it together. So Trust and the Smart City, our article, we have an editorial, but we also have an article in this special issue and we title it The Hong Kong Paradox. So I always tell my students to have eye-catching title and I hope that you understand what I mean by eye-catching title. And I hope you find this an eye-catching uh, title indeed. So I will just uh, tell you briefly and then pass the floor to uh, Alistair. So what is the background? The background is that we started our research in 2019. And when we started our research in 2019, Hong Kong had been consistently ranked as one of the world leading smart cities in all the world rankings. However, it so happens that when we started our research, there were some very disruptive changes in Hong Kong. And the one country, two, uh, one country, two system formula was being uh, redefined. Uh, we also have more integration, political and economical integration from Hong Kong to the Greater Bay Area and hence to Menon China. And this is exactly the topic we discussed in the previous hour. So political integration, economic uh, integration, but on top of that, we have a third trend that is the stringent anti-COVID-19 policies applied to mainland China and to Hong Kong. So all these combined together basically challenged very much the status of Hong Kong as Asia's world city. And this motto has been Hong, uh, Hong Kong's motto for the last 10 years and reenacted, revived 
in January 2023, so just last month. So basically, we try to capture how Hong Kong can continue to be Asia's world city and most importantly, a smart city amid all these disruptive changes. And in order to capture these uh, changes, we have conducted a territory-wide survey of uh, over 800 respondents. It was a phone survey. We had conducted 27 uh, semi-structured interviews as well as four uh, focus uh, groups. So basically, we try to uh, capture the recent history of Hong Kong and Hong Kong in the post-NSL era. So basically, in this new era, what it means uh, to link Hong Kong with the smart city, which is a public policy, but also to explore this through the lenses of trust. Alistair. Okay, uh, th uh, thanks, Emily. It's a great pleasure to be here. What a, what a wonderful uh, lecture theatre. Trust in the smart city. Now, th that's a tough one. Trust, it's like um, taking a jelly okay, and trying to pin it to the wall, trying to sort of, what do we mean by trust? How can we specify it? You know, how can we actually define uh, what, what, what we're talking about? It's very slippery, okay? Very slippery. And I think I would say uh, that in our special issue, we try and do various things, uh, undoubtedly uh, too many things, but we're really interested in the idea that public policies like the smart city don't work really unless they're, they're trusted by the people, okay? Uh, unless there's a there's a minimum amount of what I call thin trust, uh, unless there's a capacity to, uh, to believe that technology will work, to believe that governors uh, operate in a in a way that's uh, that's um, uh, honest, benevolent, uh, and that they're competent. Unless we have those 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 almost invisible qualities, but unless we have those qualities, then in a way, public policy making doesn't work very easily. So you need to, and particularly in the case of data, if you're going to share your data, then you need to, to to trust in a way. You need to trust the intermediaries. You need to trust the technology. Will, will it work? Okay. There's no point sharing your data if the technology doesn't work. Do you do you trust the people who actually uh, create the smart city apps, for example? You know, do you trust the, the companies that are involved? Do you trust the government? I'm sorry, Emily, I'm going all over the place here in relation to the, the slides. We agreed we'd um, I'd do two and three, but I, and I, I, I am sort of sticking to it. Okay, I'm going to nine. Sorry, I'm, I'm going straight away to nine. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to nine. No, I'm sorry, I'm going up to nine. It's okay. We've, we've been um, very, uh, we're having a form of participatory trust here. You know, we're participatory deliberating together. Now, the smart city then, what, what's this all about? Well, I think the smart city, we can define it, uh, as, uh, as the Dean said, very, very pertinently. We can talk just about technology. You know, we can, in a sense, we can have a sort of technology uh, obsession. And I think when we look actually at much of the, di the discussion about smart city, it's all about technology. And of course, technology is important. Of course it is. But it's not the only dimension of a smart city. Um, smart, and we, we were talking about this very interestingly uh, in French last night. And we were, we were sort of saying that what's interesting is in, in Asia in general, I suppose that the, technolog the technological dimension of smart city is certainly prevalent. Whereas in Europe, perhaps there's a rather a more balanced view whereby the sustainability dimension is perhaps slightly more important than in the general case in Asia. But anyway, a smart city clearly is a city that uses information and communication technologies to enhance the quality and performance of urban services. Smart City Blueprint, which is the formal uh, a document of the Hong Kong government, it, it talks about six dimensions of this, economy, mobility, environment, people, living and governance. 130 measures in the Smart City Blueprint. Uh, we're not going to talk about all of them, uh, you, you can be sure. But in terms of trust in the Smart City, what we try and do here, I'm on this slide now, can I, can I speak to this one? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, so trust actually, as a, you know, uh, I'm just, trust in a way, it's this rather undefinable yet essential quality for making sure that public policy works. The OECD argued, Governments cannot function effectively without the trust of citizens, nor can they successfully carry out public policies, notably more ambitious reform agendas. But in a way, this, this sums up our project, really. 
Rather than just being a set of technical issues, debates on trust and the smart city, they get to the heart of the public sphere. They concern public-private interactions, transnational learning, public debates, ethical dilemmas, particularly ethical dilemmas. I mean, I think we've all read Kevin's work and, and he'll present it later, but clearly the ethical dimension of this is, is extremely important. The matters of interdisciplinary social scientific inquiry. In our project, of course, we have the, the pleasure of working with our colleagues from the geography department in Hong Kong Baptist University with coming with a different sort of set, a different toolkit in a way, but very, very interesting to sort of mix political philosophy, uh, energy studies, uh, comparative politics, you know, to, to put them all in, in one project. I think it's been, it's been very interesting. In, in our article, we talk about, there are many different sorts of trust, but we talk about four types of trust principally. Firstly, characteristic trust. We carried out the survey and we wanted to know uh, what were your views towards the smart city depending on age, gender, level of education, place of birth, even political inclination. Okay, we had, I think, some nice findings on that, uh, which, which we can come back to in, in, in another slide. Data trust. Do we trust, in a sense, data? Do we think it will work? Do we trust the processes around the collection of data? Do we think our data is safe? Do we need, do we need our confidentiality to be respected? Do we place a value on transparency? On the, uh, do, we, do we place a value on being able to... To, to, to reconstitute data. Um, and, and then thirdly, do we trust the providers? Do we trust companies, for example? Do we think it's okay for companies to have our data? Do we trust uh, government or district councils or foreign governments or, or whatever? Then these are all important dimensions. And then finally, of course, is it an epiphenomenon? Phenomenon. I can say it in French, but not in English. <laughs> Much easier in French. Actually. Is it an epiphenomenon? Uh, in a way, when we're talking about trust in the smart city, are we actually talking about something else? No. Uh, and that's that's something that I think came out clearly when it, in our project. Uh, we, of course, were talking about smart city, but but some of the questions we were asking led us maybe to go beyond uh, smart city. So I don't want to say too much because there's so many other things to say. How much more time do I have? Than I a minute? Yes, a minute. So you okay. Can please yeah, a minute. Time. Very, very quickly. This was, a, this was a, a, a project with four work packages, uh, each of which are represented somewhat in the special issue. Um, uh, 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 Daphne uh, and Darren worked very much on smart energy. Um, we worked uh, in our team, we started off working about smart government, really, smart governance, particularly the, the, the smart ID card. We, we, we sort of spilled over a little bit, to, to be fair. Um, we also had a... Um, we had an international dimension in our project, the collaboration with the colleagues in France in, in Sciences Po Lyon. Uh, and then Kevin uh, was very much looking at the ethical underpinnings of, of, of big data and smart city. So I think we carried out, as everybody said, we had, a, we had a mass survey, we had 27 interviews, we had four focus groups. And then of course, the, uh, Daphne uh, and Darren carried out additional work for, from their perspectives. So I won't say much more about that because we're now going to spill over into the findings. Okay, so I will just take a couple of minutes to share with you the uh, findings and then Alistair will uh, do the conclusions. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, just uh, so uh, our article is actually in open access. So should you want to uh, uh, know more, it is uh, easily accessible to you. Uh, let me just uh, share some... Uh, uh, findings. So we have this uh, survey that was a phone survey, and we have all these characteristics. So when we uh, Alice talked about characteristic trust, we talked about whether uh, the Hong Kong citizen had a high public trust and being supportive. And yes, they do. Uh, we have found that in our survey. And if they had these characteristics of uh, being a um, more elder citizen with a lesser education, they belong, they identified themselves with the pro establishment co uh, camp, and they were born or coming from mainland China, or some of them were even retired. And those were the people we found had more uh, trust. Uh, uh, trust in the data. So we have all these as well. So how well do you understand contents of the smart city uh, blueprint? So we have all this uh, large data. And again, the data is also uh, made in uh, open access to you. And what we have found is that 41% of the interviewees 
actually did not understand the public policy, the program of the government that is to make a smart city. So it starts with that, you know, when uh, the narrative, the urban narrative of Hong Kong is to portray and project itself as a smart city, but its own Hong Kong residents actually close to half were not able to understand uh, what that meant. So that was very uh, turning to uh, us. We have also uh, shown in our survey that there was some uh, opposition uh, to government collecting personal data to improve public services. So across many countries, we have this uh, collection of uh, data by uh, agencies, and actually it is always meant to have a better, smarter government for the betterment of the society uh, and the people. But in Hong Kong, we have uh, seen that across the board, we have very little trust in the government collecting such data, even if it was for health purposes. So uh, the trust in uh, the data is reflected for uh, the mistrust in the government, but also for the concern of personal privacy. But this is a trend that we see emanating from uh, many other countries uh, in other continents. We also uh, try to measure the trust in the intermediaries of the smart city. So basically, those are the providers uh, of the smart city uh, technologies. And we ask uh, these uh, questions. So the providers, they can be uh, community organizations, but they can also be corporations and foreign funding companies. So we look at uh, all these uh, type of uh, different uh, providers. And basically, we see that although they may trust some of these providers and the article of uh, Dr. Ma and Dr. Chung do show that with the case of China Light and Power. But ultimately, it is a trust in the government that creates this paradox. So the paradox, to put it in a nutshell, such as a take home message, the people of Hong Kong are highly connected uh, people. They are uh, techno wise, indeed, very much. Um, they uh, are very uh, connected to the world and to their devices, but at the same time, they have very little trust in the way that data has been used. And this is very much linked to the trust in the government, and it has reflected somehow the recent trends in Hong Kong. And now I pass to Alistair for the conclusion. Thanks. I, I, I won't say much for the conclusion because Emily's done a, a smashing job really, concluding uh, already, and so I won't get into to repetition. But essentially, we are, I think th there are always, you know, questions in the in this sort this sort of research. You know, we have to ask, I think, uh, important questions, including when we're at the end of the project. You know, what are the new questions that need to be put forward in the in the next project, if you like? Well, what I say from this one is data trust paradox. In a way, there's a high support for technology in a relatively low trust environment. How do we explain this? How do we balance it? That's I think it's an interesting uh, dimension that we can we can we can. Go further. Uh, social impact of trust and mistrust uh, strongly correlated with age and political affiliation. Smart city. We haven't said a huge amount about the smart city here, partly because uh, other other speakers will, 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 will focus in more on this. It, but it but it is it is the case, and I would repeat that really, you know, the Hong Kong public appears to us totally throughout this uh, about throughout the whole project as being very technically astute. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, easily adaptable to technology, and yet requiring a bit more, requiring a little bit more to be able to get the fullest use of the technology. So in a sense, I won't say many more things than that. There's plenty more uh, to, to go in the next project. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So now we can uh, invite uh, the next uh, um, authors of the article. So, uh, Dr. Chons, Darren, and Daphne, may I invite you from, from here? And let me uh, end this PowerPoint. Good afternoon. Um, today, Darren and I are going to uh, make a presentation on our study. And first of all, I'd like to um, say a big thank you to Professor Kwong, Emily, and Hong Kong MU for inviting us our Energy Study Center to come uh, to this seminar. This is a very huge pleasure for us. Now today, um, our topic is about understanding smart energy transition as a new source of distrust. So I uh, we echo Professor Coe's uh, remarks just now that Hong Kong people will special in one way that we have um, high aspiration and welcoming high technology, smart technologies. But on the other hand, it opened up um, new sources 
of mistrust uh, or new sources of governance challenges for us. So this is the essence of our study. And um, we conduct um, uh, research with uh, Hong Kong citizens and we uh, try to understand the, uh, the risk the risk perception um, on the regional energy collaboration in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. Okay, um, this is a slide on the contest, a significance of our study. Um, around the world, many countries and cities have already set a, a very ambitious carbon neutral goal by 2050. So for our perspective is that smart energy um, transitions is key to delivering um, such an ambitious goal. And there is indeed urgency for us to change or transform the existing power sector uh, into a very different one uh, with, uh, through integrating ICT, the information and communication technologies into traditional energy system. And um, so the large scale decarbonization and digitalization of our increasing interconnected, uh, interconnected energy system would be the key for us to deliver carbon neutral goals. Um, having said all these, we understand that such transitions, even though it's a must, is uh, very important, but it would um, incurred a very uh, long and lengthy process um, of structural changes. And such transitions would cover both the demand side and supply side of management. So in um, uh, uh, a more layman um, uh, terms, uh, what we are going to see is that through these smart energy transitions, you and I, as a citizen, uh, let, uh, as a um, electricity end user, we are going to be much more active in the energy system. Um, take out your smartphone, you will see that um, there are lots of apps and in the smart, cent, uh, smart energy system, uh, smart consumers can make use of uh, smart meters installed at home and uh, collecting real-time data of your own consumption at home. And then you can kind of uh, manage the energy use automatically. And on the supply side, we are seeing um, the centralization through uh, installing more solar on the rooftops around Hong Kong. So we're building kind of a community solar development. And um, so you can see that uh, such energy transitions has to be citizen-centered because it would work only when you and I accept it or welcome such changes because we are um, we change from the passive actors into proactive um, actors. So public acceptance is the key. And then we see that trust is a pre, um, precondition of public acceptance. Um, a bit of the contest, our study is that uh, energy collaboration uh, between Hong Kong and our neighboring province, Guangdong, uh, has been uh, well established for more than four decades. Um, and uh, but historically, such collaboration, cross-border uh, collaboration has been constrained, limited to conventional energy sources, uh, for instance, natural gas or nuclear power. Okay. Now the recent um, policy changes is that um, the national government introduced um, the outline development plan for Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau, Great, um, Great Bay Area in year 2019. So that make, um, uh, make it very explicit that that is the national policy direction that Hong Kong um, will um, intensify the collaboration with the, uh, uh, another 10 neighboring cities in the Great Bay Area. So that opened up the new regional opportunities for Hong Kong to work um, uh, more intensively with the 10 other cities in this region on more proactive or um, low tech, uh, low carbon, high tech energy options such as renewable energy and the development of green high tech industries. 
Um, this is a slide about the uh, theoretical perspectives of our study. Um, from the um, perspective of trust, we see that the public perception on risk in such a smart energy transitions uh, matters a lot. Uh, why? Uh, smart energy transitions is a special kind of uh, transition because it integrates, it focuses so much on the smart energy technologies such as smart meters and big data, real-time data, that's all there. So um, by its very nature, such transition involve a wide range of actors from power companies to intermediaries, third party, uh, individual consumers. And when we um, get to um, government, even though we have multiple levels of government that matters from the national government, regional government in Guangdong, and also back to Hong Kong government. So such a complex uh, dynamic uh, stakeholder landscape make it um, a, a governance challenges for governments to deal with uncertainties. And um, from the literature, uh, such risks um, are many. Uh, you can see that from climate risk, environmental risk, price, uh, job losses, data privacy. Okay? Now, from the perspective of trust, we see that um, trust um, can make um, great contribution to such energy transition because it can help us to manage with um, it is a trust is a prerequisite for effective risk management can um, strengthen policy legitimacy and improve policy efficiency. Okay. And uh, we see that uh, home to trust also matters a lot. And the very uh, dimensions, which dimensions of trust that matters that um, three um, key dimensions, including trust in information, motives, and competence. Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, pass this to Darren yeah. to present the findings, yep. the methodology. Yeah. One second. Uh, so um, so uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the methodology and uh, and, and the findings. So uh, in our study, so we use a methodology called uh, an online deliberative poll. So uh, deliberative poll is a methodology which is trained out by uh, the Stanford University Center of Deliberative uh, Democracy. So um, uh, I will talk a little bit about um, what is what deliberative poll is all about. So uh, in contrast to a traditional poll, so which is a one-off like a cross-sectional, um, a deliberative poll is um so we try to give an uh, informed uh, uh, informed information to the participants so that they have like informed decisions and uh, and to check and and we also employed a process of questionnaires so so for T one T two and T T three uh, as I put it here so uh, we try in T uh, three different time frames uh, throughout the uh, conduction of the the uh, of the online deliberative poll. Um, so to check so whether they have like significant changes in their attitudes and opinions before and after the uh, the poll. Um, so basically, uh, we conduct the poll, and then uh, we have basically three set of the uh, 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 research data. The first one is the of course the questionnaires. So um, there are uh, the, the, uh, during the three different times. The second one is the transcription. So uh, during the uh, the elaborated poll, so we have like a discussion section, small group discussion sections, as well as uh, um, the plenary sections, where in which we invited um, specialists and then to answer questions and um, to taking questions uh, from the participants. And we also um, use some um, new, art, new articles and also government reports and then to some uh, to uh, supplementary data and then to support our arguments. Um, so um, the rundown of the uh, uh, of the uh, online deliberative poll is, is as follows. First of all, before um, before the, the, the poll, so um, the participant is asked to um, to fill in a pre-DP questionnaire, the T1 questionnaire, 
and then so that and, and to also to have uh, some uh, training section on the software that we are going to use uh, uh, in the in the poll. Uh, this is uh, and, and then um, uh, a few days before the poll is organized, was organized, and and then and then they were they are given a um, briefing document so called the briefing documents uh, give them the background information as well as uh, three scenarios about so what we are going to do so we have like three proposals or three scenarios that is given to, to them so that they have an idea so if we are going to do that so so what, what do you think about that and then uh, moving on like right before the, the uh, on, on on the day of the online development poll so right before it, it was started um so they are asked to fill in another questionnaire which is basically the same identical to the first one and then to check after reading the the, the documents or whether they have changed in their opinions and uh, attitudes and then um that will be the start of the deliberative poll um there will, will be like uh, one uh, small group discussion followed by a panel section then that is a q a section and then another small group uh, discussion another panel section and then a final round of small group discussion and after that, they are asked to um to fill in uh, the third uh, questionnaire. So to check whether after reading the documents, after the discussion, and also the Q and A section, so whether they have significant changes of uh, opinions and attitudes. So um sorry, this is in Chinese. Um so because uh, our uh, our online deliberative poll uh, was conducted in Chinese with Hong Kong citizens, so then the documents it was also in Chinese. So um uh to keep uh, things short, so basically we propose uh, three um three scenarios. The first one was very, uh, in relation to the import of uh, re renewable energies from uh, the Great Bay area. So the first one is that basically we don't import anything. So which is called the BAU business as usual scenario. The second one was about uh, the moderate change. Moderate change rate in which well, we are going to import about 10% of the renewable energy uh, from, from the Great Bay area. And we also have the third one, which is the, a more aggressive the scenario in which we are going to import about 18% uh, of the renewable energy uh, from the Great Bay uh, area. Oh, sorry. Thanks. So a little bit about the uh, component um, uh, composition of the participants. So we have a sample of our WhatsApp for um, Hong Kong citizens. Um, basically, uh, uh, we try to follow as um, the, the uh, gender and also the um, age, um, the ratio of the age uh, of the Hong Kong citizens uh, according to the public pyramid. And uh, we also have some some um, uh, some basic statistics this year. So the age group, which is uh, basically middle age, um, so we have like roughly the same of a male and female uh, ratio. Uh, the whole size is basically uh, three members. Uh, most of them are university educated, and uh, income that it will be the annual household income will be about. So that's you could say there there be the classes, and this is about the. Uh, mm. The uh, electricity expenses are uh, monthly. If the electricity expenses, uh, they, they will get paid. So this is uh, this is the third finding. So the third finding is about um. So we 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 ask so whether you trust about um, um different government agencies. So and and in comparison to the uh, electricity companies in Hong Kong. So we ask them three dimensions. The first one is uh, trust in information. The second one is uh, the trust in motives. And the third one will be uh, trust in um, competence. Uh, the first one, so as you, as, as you could see, when we're ask, asking about the information, about the transparency of the information given by different government agencies, so whether you trust uh, the information or not. The citizens give um, in T1, T2, and T3, as, as you can see, so they have a lot of trust. Uh, so they think that Hong Kong electricity companies are more trustworthy than uh, the different level of governments. So whether you are talking about the Latin government, the Guangdong government, or the Hong Kong government, the percentage is overwhelming, 70 something percent compared to less than 10 percent. So the Hong Kong government, you may say, so you, you have more trust than the national and government and Guangdong government. And if we move on to talk about um, trust the motives, so whether you trust the motives, so then um, the percentage of, of, of trust to the Hong Kong electricity companies is a lower compared to the trust in information, but still, so uh, you have about 50% of trust. 
But uh, when you talk about like, the governments, uh, well, still, okay, you have less than 10% for national government and also the foreign government. For Hong Kong government, it is about um, somewhat between 12% to 40%. And you can see that, so there were no significant, very significant change um, uh, between the different time uh, before and after the, the, the online deliberative de poll. So basically, um, their trust level uh, to different um, government bodies and the uh, and the electricity companies are basically the basically same, and so that will be the same for trust in competence. And, and you can see that so still uh, the Hong Kong electricity companies are has the most uh, regarded as the most trustworthy parties, uh, and by Hong Kong citizens and followed by uh, the Hong Kong government, which has um, at most ninety percent after the um, after the poll. And the national and national government and and the Guangdong government still they they have less than ten percent of the level of people saying that they are trustworthy. So the second finding. So we talk about um. So, uh, if we think that so these government agency are not very trustworthy, then um, what is the components? What do they think about the government's motive? So um, when we talk about the smart energy transitions, so here are some of the um, some of the summary uh, to to keep things short. So the first thing is um, so this is a doubt. Uh, so most people or um, the participant they doubt the Hong Kong government whether they have a commitment in developing local RE. So uh, what they what is uh, uh, there is an association between the uh, RE import and also the developing local RE. And if we talk about the developing local RE, so we try to associate it with uh, so-called the energy autonomy. So, so this is like, um, so we could produce uh, the energy locally, and then we don't have to rely on the others. And if we talk about RE imports from the Greater Bay Area, for example, so, um, so that means that we are going to rely on imports, and that will reduce to as opposed to um, uh, upholding local energy autonomy. So this is um, one of the major things that we observed, um, the association that is uh, from the uh, opinions of the participants. And the third thing we talk about, um, we, we observed is that, so there is a distrust in the energy reliability with more RE import from the Great Bay Area. So what does that mean? So um, basically, um, People um observed or they perceive that so if we import more uh, energy from the Great Bay Area, the energy reliability will uh, will de will decrease uh in, in Hong Kong. So there will be more power outage uh, in Hong Kong. So um there there could be there could be um so the electricity stability uh, will be downgraded um so on so forth. So this is the, their imagination, or that is based. There was uh, I'm going to talk about. So that was based on their past experience uh, about the uh, about the performance of the of the Greater Bay Area. So because we have like different collaborations with the Greater Bay areas, so um one of them is so called the Dongzhuang uh, water. So we purchase the water from China and. Over time, the quality of the water um was not stable and um maybe deteriorated. But um, the price they did not go down, and we don't have any. Uh, we don't have a power to bargain. Uh, we we just have to. We cannot say anything, and we just have to uh, stick with it. So this is one thing that is in their in their mind. Um. So the fourth one is the concern about the current stable electricity supply. So we have to be sacrificed. So if we are going to do us uh, uh, to uh, to develop the cross border cross bridge uh, infrastructure to have more integration with them, so this is basically basically according the the third um uh, argument. So um so we talk about um the so Dr. Ma talk, uh, talk, talk about the theoretical underpinning of the risk uh, in trust. So basically, um, we also identify five sources of um trust um uh, risk, um as the new source of public distrust um in the government competence. So this five uh source of um a risk uh uh are price volatility, energy reliability, cost overrun, and the privacy and environmental risk. The first one is about price volatility. 
So what 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 the essence is that so if we are going to purchase a lot a lot more uh, energy from China or from a particular area, so so um so we have to bear the fluctuating price, the electricity price. So this is um so they highlighted the drawn water. Uh, so I've just talked about as an example. So we don't have a much bargaining power if we are going to rely more on that. So the second one is about energy reliability risk. So um this time they highlight the, the case of Macau. So mm -hmm. several years ago there was a typhoon, um a very major typhoon in Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong as, as well as in Macau. But uh, as for the case of Macau, they have a long, uh, uh, a very long uh, power outage. So because um, most of the electricity comes from the Macau electricity comes from the uh, the Greater Bay Area, the Southern Power Grid, uh, more than ninety percent. And at that time, so because the power infrastructure, the transmission towers was was damaged, was damaged, and they so they need to support a long term of power outage. And so if Hong Kong was like Macau, so we, we import a lot of uh, uh, energy from uh, China or from particular great area. So do we suffer the same thing? So are we going to have such a so, uh, such disadvantage? So the reliability, we are going to question about that. Um, so that's uh, the Hong Kong citizens, the participants, and that's what they say. The third one is the cost of one. So um, so in order to, uh, if we are going to uh, import uh, more uh, energy from the Greater Bay Area, so that we have to in uh, upgrade the energy infrastructure. So one of them would be the transmission system system. So the cost of the transmission system could be very high to develop that. Um, and so given that, so um, we had to like uh, the Hong Kong um, uh, in the past uh, few years, in the past that case, for example, so there are a lot of major infrastructure projects um, initiated by the Hong Kong government. And so most of them, uh, they have cost of runs. Uh, for example, the high-speed uh, railway um, connecting Hong Kong with um, the Guangdong area and uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong, Zhuhai, uh, Macau Bridge um, was another uh, another example. So most of these major uh, infrastructure connecting, um, trying to integrating uh, Hong Kong with the Greater Bay Area. So most of them has caused ruin. So these are highlighted um, by the participants. So, um, so if we are going to have more electricity import, so do we need to bear this cost of run as well? So this is the question. Um, data privacy. So basically, um, in uh, the participants' mind, so they think that they perceive that. So people, uh, the government is going to monitor the data. So, um, so privacy is always an issue that they think that. Um, so, but they have to, um, but, but uh, your privacy will be uh, captured or stored uh, in the database anyway. And um, it is just like, um, so you cannot stop the government from uh, monitoring or, or maybe manipulating um, if they want to do so. Um, so they have this doubt. Um, the finally, uh, environmental risk. Um, so if you are going to build more infrastructure during the upgrade of the uh, transmission system, so then you will destroy the ecology, you destroy, destroy the environment for this, uh, uh, in order to fulfill so more energy import from China or from the Bay Area. So, so there will be a risk uh, on that. And um, so we try to link um, um, the findings with um, uh, Dr. Amy Chan and uh, Professor Kuo. And then to see whether the demographic and the sociopolitical context uh, has an impact to the public distrust. So the first thing uh, we find that so basic age groups. So that means that um, there are more if you are more the older you are, um, if you have a larger family or you have more children. So basically, it has some relationship, uh, not a strong relationship, a weak one, but you still have some relationship with the trust level to different government. Um, so if you are elderly. Um, you, are, you have more a larger family, so you have more children, so you're you you are more inclined to, to trust the government. So this is our finding. The second one would be about um. So as I said, so they have like poor perceptions um of the of the and the the, the collaboration between um Hong Kong and the uh, Greater Bay uh, area. So the water involved was highlighted. Um, the energy management. So they highlighted the Macau case. So um so that image was bad and created some created some bad impression 
about um, about uh, this uh, collaborate uh, integration or collaboration uh, projects, and that added to the distrust to the governance. The third thing we find you know, is that so during so when we conduct the online uh, deliberative poll, well, it was in July 2020. So if you still remember, so in 2019, so there was a series of uh, social movements and social events happened in Hong Kong, and it had a adverse effect to the citizens' trust to the government, whether it is the um, national government, the ground government, and also the Hong Kong government. And uh, we think that it had a major impact to the low level of trust um, reported by the citizens, uh, by the participants uh, in the questionnaire. Um, a little bit of conclusion. So we think so then, um, Public concept perception of, of uh, risk is basically related. We found that related to public trust. And this very right linkage is evident uh, when we talk about the regional smart energy transition in the Greater Bay Area. So we highlighted and we summarized really, uh, five types of uh, risk that may serve as a counter-reacting uh, force of um, uh, integrating uh, with the Greater Bay Area in terms of regional velocity energy transitions. Um, I want to highlight um, one thing about the limitation. So uh, we found a lot of association between the risk and trust uh, in our article, um, but uh, we have not been able to prove the co uh, the co causality uh, between public uh, perception of trust and the trust level. So um so next if we want to do further study so to what extent so the the men uh, to what extent the risk um can foster trust uh, in smart energy transition in Greater Bay Area so I think this is the next question that we are next research research question that we are going to focus on and to do uh, further study so that's the end of my sharing uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we can proceed with our third presentation. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Kevin Ip from the Hong Kong uh, Baptist University. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so um, the paper that I co-author with uh, Crystal Jones, a uh, very talented young scholar, uh, which was eventually published in China Perspective, was entitled Smart City Development in Hong Kong and Ethical Analysis. So, um, okay, so uh, these are the research questions that we were interested in. Uh, what are the moral, uh, first, what are the moral implications of developing a smart city? and how to assess the more risk of various smart city initiatives and what are the possible strategies to mitigate these moral risk. So uh, like many cities in uh, advanced economies, Hong Kong has embraced uh, the smart city agenda, right? Trying to build a smart uh, city in Hong Kong. Um, so uh, when you look at the issue, uh, that's, uh, you know, smart city is about like using uh, new technologies and innovations uh, to improve the management and the efficiency uh, in the urban uh, management or in the urban environment. So, uh, so many of these talks about smart city uh, were framed in a more technical sense, right? Why don't you like your city being smarter? Right. Why don't you like uh, uh, your uh, the urban management in your city to be more efficient, to be better somehow? Uh, but uh, you know, as a political theorist, I will naturally think, okay, that is also an ethical dimension of it, and and that is the motivation for me to uh, write this paper. But uh, for the interest of time, uh, I will mainly focus on the uh, eth uh, ethical framework that we developed in this paper. Uh, but not so much on the details in the case study, which I will encourage you to read the full paper uh, uh, for that. Okay, so uh, we start with the uh, premise or observation that technologies are not morally uh, neutral, right? Or to be more specific, the applications of those technologies, they are not morally neutral, right? 
So uh, because they can be used for morally acceptable or unacceptable purposes, uh, they have a lot of impacts on individual or collective well-beings. And also uh, the application of technologies often give powers to some agents over others and may create or reinforce social divisions. Okay, so, uh, you know, for example, uh, 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 the use of the Leap Home Safe apps uh, in Hong Kong until uh, very late last year, uh, it's basically, uh, uh, well, but not only the, the technology itself, but when it become a legal requirement, Right in Hong Kong, that if you want to enter a restaurant, you want to go to see a movie, and even to enter some uh, government buildings and facilities, right, which citizens are entitled to use their services, you are required to use uh, this Lip Home Safe apps. And if you fail to comply, then you're subject to legal sanctions. So clearly, this this particular way of using the technology will give uh, uh, you know uh, some agents some power over others. Right now, the owners of the sh restaurants or the raters or, or the civil servants in those government facilities, they will have the power to check if you comply. Uh, and then the police will, will enforce those rules, sometimes going into a restaurant, like checking everyone's cell phone to see if they have used it. Uh, and so it definitely opens up the danger of whether these rules are being enforced selectively, right, against certain shops and, and restaurants. So I think it's... it's uh, and also, uh, it will... There were cases where, you know, uh, uh, a homeless person were required to use the phone safe app, which he or she might not have a smartphone, right? And not, and also the visually impaired persons, right? Because it, 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 if you use it, it basically if you visually impaired, it's, it's exceedingly difficult for you to use the app. So it's all, you know, have the impact. And uh, in this case, unequal impact on the well-being of many individuals. Um, so there's a lot of things. So technologies or the applications of these technologies, they are not morally neutral. So that's uh, something we need to be, uh, we look, need to look at. And um, uh, so I, I try to briefly respond um, to uh, this trust, the theme of special user trust in the smart city. You know, Trust also has a ethical dimension, right? It's not just a subjective attitude, right? You might trust or not trust someone, or you may, we may ask how much you trust. But you know, trust is not always good, right? Sometimes you might trust the wrong persons, the wrong organizations, or place too much trust in them. Uh, trust is also particularly dangerous because whenever you trust a person, then you become vulnerable to their goodwill. Right, you accept the possibility of being harmed by them if they don't respond to your trust appropriately. Right, that, that is the essential nature of trust. But trust is so essential to social cooperation. Uh, uh, but it has, you know, it's so uh, complicated. In a smart city, uh, residents in a smart cities they are subject to continuous surveillance with a widespread belief in the objective quantifications and potential tracking of all kinds of human behavior and social interactions. So, uh, well, we have no choice but to put some fiend trust in the agents that collect, interpret, and share the data that we have to provide, right, in a smart city. So we have no choice but to provide them. So um, so that I think there's a very uh, uh, complicated or even paradoxical uh, uh, relationship of trust uh, in the smart city. So basically, um, so um, I, so the sources of information for my study is basically from uh, a, a number of government documents and public uh, information, especially this one, the Hong Kong Smart City Blueprint 2.0, uh, originally published in 2020, and also public information and government documents from various government departments and uh, the documents that the government gave gave to the Legislative Council in Hong Kong. That was the main sources of our information. And I also uh, look into a number of works uh, in political philosophy, right, to formulate, to try to formulate the ethical theme of how we can analyze this. So the first thing is, is uh, very important, I have to say, is that, so um, in this article, we're not trying to argue whether, you know, the smart city is a morally good or bad thing. I think that's too crude. To say, as you can see, uh, even from the Hong Kong Smart City Blueprint, uh, there are over 
130 smart city initiatives. They're, they're very different. They're very distinct in different uh, areas from uh, the economy, environment, mobility, living, people and government. So I think it will be too crude uh, or over some uh, simplistic to say whether you know developing a uh, smart city is good or bad thing from an ethical perspective. But um, uh, I think it will be more uh, useful or helpful if we can look into the specific smart city projects and to determine what kind of more risk they may have. But then we still need a framework, some principle to decide like what kind of more risk we're we talking about, like how serious they are. So that's why I, we try to come up with this uh, framework uh, uh, to do and uh, look at selected um, uh, smart city projects in Hong Kong. Okay. So, yeah. So the normative framework that we employed in this paper is called relational egalitarianism. Okay, it is a theory of social justice that I uh, have defended uh, uh, in my PhD studies and over some of my other publications. So, um, so but basically the, the fundamental idea is that equality is about the nature of relationship people have. So uh, a kind of relationship that is not uh, 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 categorized by exploitation or domination or distinction of ranks and power, right? That is the ideal, right? So ideally, that uh, uh, residents in the smart city should enjoy an equal standing with one another. They're, they're equally citizens uh, in that smart city, right? Uh, I think it's uh, some of the ethical connotations of you know the idea of citizenship. It must be e equal in some morally significant and relevant ways. Um, so we start with this uh, uh, idea of relational egalitarianism, and then we further look into some of the specific principles that, uh, that we can use to assess the uh, implications of uh, building a smart city. First is this idea, uh, uh, we have the three principles. First, the principle of non-domination, which state that in applying technologies to urban management, the authority should promote equal freedom and non-dominations uh, for the residents. That means people should not be subject to arbitrary interference over their choices uh, uh, down to the applications of those technologies. And second, uh, we have this uh, principle of trust responsiveness that the smart city agents should promote relationship of trust by acting according to the ex expectations of the residents. So I want, maybe I need to uh, elaborate more on this idea of trust. So um, yeah, when I say trust, it's not always good. So um, okay, so, so one example uh, that we might have is um, uh, especially for uh, relational egalitarian, because trust implies some sort of power inequality, right? The people who trust others uh, will be vulnerable and you know accept the possibility of being harmed by the other persons uh, if they fail to respond to that kind of trust. So you 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 will see why trust uh, uh, is ethically important, except especially in in uh, in a smart city setting. So um, okay, so you you may imagine this. So so you might say that uh, you know my, as a teacher my student trusts me to grade their assignment fairly. Let's say that that is you know, not particularly controversial, but of course I will have a more obligation to grade my student's assignment fairly, whether they trust me or not, right? So that's for sure. But if they trust me and I fail, and I then fail to grade their assignments fairly, then you might say uh, in, in, in addition to violating my obligation as a teacher, to grade my students' assignment fairly. I also betray my students' trust on me. And that is a further wrong that I may be committed, which might not exist uh, 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 if my students never trust me uh, from the beginning. Okay, so, uh, so the same thing we might apply to, a similar logic may apply to this setting of smart city is that, you know, uh, residents in a smart city trust their data, right, with various authorities by providing them anyway, although they may not have much of a choice, but well, I will think it's fair to say that at least some, many of them, they, they really trust them, 
right, to use. So if then the authorities in the smart city use the data in a way that's uh, not to improve uh, the living standards of those residents or for some purposes that uh, the residents would not approve of, that you might say this authority, they betray their trust uh, in providing the data that makes uh, those smart city technologies possible. Because a lot of these smart city technologies, they are possible uh, only when you know many, many residents provide their data, right? Without those data, those technology would not be so useful. Okay, but that's of course in, in actual cases, a lot of cases where people would dispute about whether, you know, what are the exact purposes of their data collection and how uh, 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 this technology are, are probably used or not. But I think that's at least a, a principle that if captured by this idea of trust responsiveness, right, could help us determine the more risk uh, of a specific smart city initiative. And finally, the third principle that we have uh, formulated in a paper is the principle of fair access to advantage. So all residents should have fair access to the benefits of living in a smart city, regardless of their gender, race, age, or socioeconomic status. So that will come into the same when we try to build a smart city, but you know, are uh, uh, those facilities or technology really, uh, uh, can, can they be enjoyed by everyone alike? Right. Or in the case of whether they will be unequal access to the, the benefits of those technology, will they be justified to those who have less? Right. Given that you know most people will have to provide the data and live under smart city, uh, I think that's a very uh, uh, fundamental more requirement that you know when deciding uh, whether a particular uh, smart city project is morally problematic or not. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so um, as I said, there are over 130 uh, smart city initiatives that was listed in the uh, uh, Hong Kong Smart City Blueprint. So uh, it was impossible for us to discuss all of them uh, in a single paper. So we have to select, but then we don't want to uh, kind of like cherry pick, right? Obviously we can all pick the worst ones, right? The most risky ones and say, okay, it's smart city, it's really a bad thing. Or we could only pick the kind of more blind one, one of the better ones. So the, oh yeah, the one thing smart city is really good. So uh, we didn't want to do that. And we try to come up with a way to um, divide this uh, initiative into different, into uh, conceptually four uh, different category, but in reality, it's only three categories. So we try to, uh, 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 try to assess these initiatives in their level of transparency first, and also their level of voluntariness. So the level of transparency is determined whether uh, the motivations and the operations of those uh, smart city initiatives, are they publicly available information? Are they transparent to the public, right? So some, some, uh, some uh, projects, some smart city initiatives, they are more transparent than others, right? The second is uh, the level of voluntariness capture whether you know the residents can really choose freely whether to join or be affected by those projects or not, right? Um, there are some uh, uh, initiatives like building a smart power grid that is less voluntary, right? Unless you don't use electricity, of course. But now it's not um, uh, not possible. But there are other like the e health system, whether it required uh, uh, kind of uh, voluntary consent and participation from uh, the resident. You can choose to join or not to join, right? And you have to authorize uh, whether your medical record will be released to a specific clinic. You have to do it uh, uh, voluntarily. So they've got a higher level and lower level of voluntariness. Um, and of course, if you look at this, uh, uh, it did not include uh, the use of the Lip Home Safe apps that I just mentioned, uh, because this article was written uh, in early 2021 when the apps was still not widely used uh, uh, before the time when people were required to use it, right? So yeah, if I, if I knew that before, that probably include that, but you know, that is the... Uh, so we select uh, uh, at least one case, one initiative to uh, analyze uh, the more implications with our non framework, at least from, from each of these three categories we have. Okay, 
So uh, in the paper, we analyzed the use of facial, uh, facial recognition system by law enforcement in Hong Kong. Uh, I think a lot of you didn't know that, right? That's true. I was using it, uh, but you know they didn't really announce it. Ah, uh, okay. And the smart lamppost pilot scheme, which I think is, is also maybe more if you'll be aware of it. Uh, and the free throw tolling system. Uh, and finally, we also uh, uh, study the electronic health record sharing system, the e-health uh, system. So these are the four cases that we have. But uh, because of the limit of time, I will not go into the detail in those cases. But uh, so I, I just present some general observations and finding after doing the case studies. Uh, so uh, so a very general point uh, that uh, after the case studies, we found that, you know, there is a strong presence of techno optimism uh, or techno solutionism in Hong Kong, especially by the Hong Kong government. Right. That means if you read through, because I read, I read through the smart city blueprints uh, 2.0, there's no mention, no mention of any ethical problems or potentials, ethical problems uh, by the government. It's all very bright and beautiful. Right, we should have you know smarter people, smarter economy, smarter government. Right, no one will object to that. So it's very you know that's this this very fundamental idea that you know more technology can only be good. Right, we see that as a problem. It's not actually a problem. Uh, uh, more problem. It's only uh, a problem that we don't have enough technology. Right. So if I have more technology, those problems can be solved. Right. That, that I think is essentially the undertone of the those government documents. And I've got the second observation, I think it's very important. Uh, it's also the starting point of the paper is a smart city initiative. They are very diverse and come with very different moral risk. Okay. I, I would like to add that although we did not discuss the, the idea of privacy uh, directly in our, which is a lot of concern uh, in, in recent years, but, but for even from our uh, non uh, framework of relational egalitarianism, uh, you know, privacy or uh, the violation of privacy can be bad because when people don't have a secure sense or their privacy is not secured, right? Uh, that is a possibility that, you know, the data they provided might be used against them someday or might be used for a purpose that they would never approve of someday. I think that is the... the the, the social dimension of privacy. Privacy, is, from my perspective, it's not simply about, you know, there's some sensitive information about me that I don't want other people to know, otherwise I will feel embarrassed. It's not something like that. It's more like we're living in an environment where the, you know, our data is not protected. They can be used against us anytime. They can be used uh, uh, for any purpose, even though we don't want to. And in, in those environments, people tend to censor themselves. It changes people's behavior and give a lot of power uh, uh, to the government over us, right? By, you know, subject us to, you know, constant surveillance. And so I think it's, it's, it's bad from a relational egalitarian perspective. So I think, although we didn't mention it uh, as a, uh, uh, the, the, the matter of privacy directly, but I think it, it, it's covered actually. It's very relevant here. Uh, the third point, um, as uh, our case study shows, low transparency and lack of the exit options uh, tends to increase the more risk of this smart city uh, initiatives. That's why uh, the use of facial recognitions and smart lamp they are kind of present more risk in our case studies than uh, uh, this uh, uh, use of the e-health system, right? This the sharing of electronic medical records uh, because it's more transparent and actually people have to sign up for the program. They're not forced to do so. So I think it it's actually makes this uh, initiative less risky from a more point of view. Yeah. So also there are some imperfect strategies to mitigate more risk associated with uh, smart city uh, 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 development. Uh, for example, by giving people some voice over how this technology is used, by uh, developing a deal process, regulating the collection of data, uh, but obviously prov providing people with an exit option, right, to this uh, project. So I think it's uh, it's about time. Uh, so uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, hope, you know, uh, waste your time any longer. So uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's 
it's very fascinating because we've been working together on this project and then after it's published to re-listen, it's really uh, enlightening and I hope my students can uh, relate with uh, many things we said uh, in the first hour. So we just have a couple of minutes. We do have a tea reception nicely organized by the uh, Division of Social Sciences. So thank you, Dr. Lamoyman who is the head of the division. So we can have, including students, some time to further uh, communicate, exchange with our guest speakers. But if you have any pressing questions, uh, it's very much welcome to, uh, to uh, ask them now. We do have microphones that can uh, be shared with the public. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm always... Uh take the initiative to ask the first question. Um, it is fascinating for, for all the papers, but when I when I listen one by one, I have the impression that in general, most of the speakers say we don't have much trust in the government. But when I listen to Kevin's paper, actually some of the development of smart city, you don't have the choice. Uh, you have the choice, but very minimal. For some of the application and some of the service provided by government. So um I'm I think whether there will be really a correlation between the level of trust in government and the development of smart city. In some specific sense, it can be no not much correlation because on one hand you don't trust the government, but the government can still provide that kind of smart city service without much options. No choice to you. So um, for that, I'm a little bit hustled. So um, any views from all the speakers? Do you think that the level of trust is really so essential for the development of smart city? For some items, I agree that I'm doubtful for some other major items. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks um, for that excellent question. I mean, I think in a way, um, what's interesting, I think, in our project is it's it's a it's a project about trusting the smart city. It doesn't mean that the smart city can be reduced to trust. The smart city actually maybe trust is not the most important thing in smart city. I mean, it, but but we you know, our our intellectual exercise I suppose, is, is to, in a way test that association. But, and, and I think the more we did this project, the more, well, certainly myself, the more I think trust is extremely important and the smart city is very important. And there is a leakage. But, you know, if we were trying to pretend that we were explaining all the smart city about trust, then we wouldn't say. I think there's it's one dimension amongst us that is important and uh, it elucidates in a way. And I think in, in relation to this, just my, my second one is what you're describing in a way is a sort of Techno, not determinism, but a, 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 the, the idea that whether or not there is trust anyway, the development of the technology will take place um, in, in some important respects. And that, and that fits in my step into Kevin's paper in particular, because then in a way, is there a real choice in, in relation to these smart thinking initiatives? Well, it's quite there. But clearly, you can't not choose to participate in, in, in any. So I think it's, it's a good question. I don't think we were trying, especially to say that everything can be explained by trust. I mean, I think actually what, what we're, the, the thinking behind this is to try and link two concepts that are actually not often linked. Of course, of course they are. But in a way, I think what we were trying to do is to, to take two literatures that are actually going to speak to each other. That's why I think they're, 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 when I spoke my colleagues and said, it's to introduce the notion of risk in that. The depths of the night friction of you know, it, it, it kind of brings the mind kind of in the in the in the cases the how sort of trust and policy are for its action to get get evaluated. And I think that risk dimension is very, very important. So I think it's legitimate to take two distinct approaches without necessarily saying that we have seen Thank you. Thank you. May I just um briefly respond to that? Oh yeah, I think when talk about trust, um um, you know, let's take what they can say. Perhaps it's also an example some people trust it, some people didn't. Uh, you know, you see people, uh, you know, buying a second 
smartphone just to install the apps. So that you know, uh, that that's you know, I'm not saying I did it, but you know, some people did. Yeah. Uh, you also see some people they are using it everywhere they go, even if it's not legally required to do so. Well, we see at supermarket they would and they would use this apps to enter the supermarket. Whether that was not legally required, it's just voluntarily use it and show that they really trust the government. Well, I think fine. I'm not I'm not judging anyone uh, for what they do, but but I think yeah, as political fears are voluntary, we would really have good reason to trust. In that particular case, I also remember uh, during the quick wave of uh, COVID 19, we see very serious spread of the virus, uh, you know, 100,000 cases every day. And at that time, you know, what the government did, but they didn't say that. They said we stopped tracing. Well, they didn't say that. Why? I thought that was used to protect people. No, because we don't have the uh, testing capacity anymore. There's too many cases. So I don't want to say, but after that, they con the, the legal requirement continued for several months. So I think well, well, that is something that will, you know, I think at least it's reasonable to suspect something else was going on. Uh, and yeah, that's my my you know, well, I can certainly have that in mind. Okay. Okay, thank you. And if I may just uh, want to end off that part in the uh, energy um, uh, etc. Uh, we see that it is, of course, um, entirely okay that we introduce smart technologies without uh, charge in society, and it's okay. But the difference is that whether the full potential of smart technologies could be utilized. So they, uh, they in many um, cities which have already a uh, smart meters, you know, plans, uh, intervention, we see that people who have smart meters installed at home, we have their app. Them, but they did not interact um, um, meaningfully with those technologies. So uh, I think that is different. And we also see that uh, I uh, agree very much with Professor Coach to remark that um, actually the whole um, subject matter is not as, uh, may not be limited to smart technologies. It is a bigger question. Whether we can kind of build communities or society through engaging them, uh, building that sort of trusty relationship, then um, alongside that of our smart technology. So that is um, uh, our energy can be started to get the lesson. Thank you So, um... In terms of upon the trust and smart it serve it every bit uh uh in this file. Um so I I'm I'm still working with Professor Paul on the paper about the, the technological purpose that they want to trust and smart it uh, survey. Um uh, let me um present a preliminary findings. So we find that uh, the correlation there is a correlation between the first level and um the satisfaction of the smart city services. So I'm, I'm not saying that so because you trust more, then you are going to use more, and then you have a higher uh, level of satisfaction. So we don't know the causality again. The, there is an association. So and then um so that is the question uh, that we want to or oh, maybe we want to further investigate, which is uh, in what sense the dynamics between trust and uh, and the smart city services. So would that would because I trust uh, the telephone safer, for example, then I think we use it more. Uh, or I'm going to try to um, not use it or try to use it in a more smart way, um, maybe to use another sample, for example. So, so this is something that we could develop and develop about. Thank you. Did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, this is a question for the final speaker, but also open to the panel. So you use the model of um, uh, relational egalitarianism, and um, you also um, sort of said that it's residents in the smart city should enjoy an equal standard of living. But when we see, because of in my sort of um, two months of being in Hong Kong, I sort of learned about the subsidized sort of um, housing and sort of the uh, the contrast of sort of um, housing in terms of you, know, you, you know, sort of higher sort of standard of living compared to. Lower standard of living. So, 
how do you see that sort of equal standard of living in a smart city where ca the current sort of um, Hong Kong has this sort of um, this subsidized housing um, and also if you go to say, um, I don't know, the, the Hong Kong Gold Coast, you've got sort of the highest sort of standard of living over there. Uh, just, um, just, um, okay, just uh, perfectly. I think it's a very interesting question. Because exactly why I was first attracted to this idea of relation to terms of this, it's not really about equal standard of living or people having equal level of income or wealth, right? Although sometimes an equal level of income level may be a problem when it brings too much power to the wealthy. So we might not have problem with someone living in a fancy apartment in the mid levels in Hong Kong, you don't drive a very expensive car. We don't really have a problem. Per se, of that. But we might have a problem if they have a kind of disproportionate influence over our public policy. That is much more problematic from the point of view of whether we are real as people citizens. Uh, in a society in nature, it's the same thing. So we might not have problem when people are driving a, a expensive Tesla electric car. But we might have problem if we spend too much resources like building the facility for the, uh, uh, the use of EVs, knowing that most of our residents will never be able to walk. I think there's more a procedural and also a kind of, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so state of matter, uh, um, uh, we shouldn't, definitely shouldn't, but, but again, uh, I think that, that the current level of social and economic inequality in Hong Kong, as I have been arguing for many, many years, is totally unacceptable. But but we're not asked, we're not, but the, the aim is not to uh, eliminate those inequalities, but make sure that they don't skew out to other important areas. Right? We well, it's okay that people want to have you know better cars, living in a better apartment, go to better restaurants, but we shouldn't stigmatize those people who can afford those things. Right. But but then that doesn't mean, you know, sometimes that inequality in income of wealth is problematic sometimes not. And I think using precisely the thing about the relationship relation with the parent, we can come up with some sort of right answer that question, how do we have? Okay, so that is uh, that has been a project that I've been doing for the last 10 years at least, uh, uh, in, in different contexts. So thank you very much for your question. Yeah. So it's already at two o'clock. Thank you. So I, I want us to thank everyone, including the students. Thank you for staying behind uh, 10 minutes uh, after the class time. If you have time, please join us for the tea reception outside and further engage with our speakers. And I want to be a big thank to our uh, administrative colleagues who have uh, done so well in uh, making this a smooth and uh, happen this morning. So uh, everyone is a warmly uh, Welcome to the tea reception, and I wish the students also a very nice weekend. And see you all on Monday or Thursdays for tutorials, and next week Friday for the lecture. Okay, so thank you, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very inspiring. Yeah. <laughs>